Thanks for your company. The details now. State prosecutors have pressed new charges against CEO of gold dealership firm Ghana Limited, uh, Men's Gold Ghana Limited, and Apia Mensa, ASP Sylvester Asari, who is leading the state's prosecution as the circuit court for an adjournment to file the new charge sheet. Mr. Mensa is currently, uh, or prior to this, was facing 13 charges, including money laundering, unlawful deposit taking, sale of minerals without license. The new charge sheet filed includes multiple charges of defrauding by false pretense, bringing the number to 61. This is the second time the charge sheet has been amended, as the first filed had seven and was increased later to 13, now stands at 61. Joe News' Joseph Akable has more. There were seven charges filed against Men's Gold CEO and Apia Mensa the very first time he was brought to court after his arrival from the United Arab Emirates. And this was subsequently increased to 13 as the state amended the case. Uh, this has happened again, increasing the number this time around from 13 to some 61 charges that have been filed. The new charges filed are no different from the previous except the complainants are mentioned individually with the amounts attached and offence of defrauding by false pretense, carrying deposit taken without license, unlawful deposit taken and sale of minerals without license, repeated for each. Some of the names mentioned are Vulcan Basla, 350,000 cities, Kofi Chenebua, 100,000 cities, Godfrey Odro Yebua, 94,500 cities, Evelyn Trefo, 170,000 cities, Emmanuel Opon Kobi, 200,000 cities, among others. ASP Sylvester Asari informed the court as a result of the development, they wanted an adjournment and have agreed with lawyers from Mr. Pierre Mensa that the case be adjourned to October 23. This was granted by the court as it was adjourned to October 23 with the expectation that by that time, the relevant documents that the state intends to rely on would have been made available for lawyers from Mr. Pierre Mensa to enable the trial to progress. Reporting for journeys from the circuit court, my name is Joseph Akable. Now, John uses checks at the home of the prime suspect involved in the killing of two policemen at Buduburam has revealed he lived in the same apartment with two other policemen. Maxwell Agbaba was also at his home in Gomwa, Buduburam, and filed the following report. This is the residence of the prime suspect, Eric um, Kojudia. Um, it's currently um, locked with two big um, padlocks. Some residents have been speaking to say after the incident happened on Thursday, um, Eric Kojudia's wife, who lived here with him, um, they saw her leave this residence to another place. Um, we are told by some sources um, that she left to Tishi, where she was later picked up by the criminal investigations um, department. Some of the tenants we have been speaking with say the one-story properties owned by a woman who we are learning from police sources is a suspect's deceased mother who bequeathed it to him. Documents covering the buildings were said to have been used at a point as surety by Eric Kujudia to secure bail for his friend. Interestingly, there was a police uniform hanging on the drying line in the house. We are told two policemen live in the same house with the prime suspect. A lot of the residents here are tight-lipped on who Eric Kodjogia is. Um, they are scared they could be um, subject for police investigations. One woman who agreed um, to speak to us says she does not know much about Eric Kodjogia. She says sometimes his children would come to her home here to play. Um, well, she says um, she always sees him around um, going about his normal duties in his car. He normally would pass in front of her house. Yeah. But a woman, I am a man, bit maybe dear girl, or money, my man, you know, be born with dear girl, I will fear her. Well, she says, uh, she says, um, sometimes, um, the suspect's children sometimes come here to come and play, um, with her children. She says, because they usually um, pass um, by in front of a house in a vehicle, she, she, she's never like had interactions with them um, before, but the children usually come here and come and play with, yeah, her children. In the Kuala Lumpur, the thing. She says um, um, the prime suspect has two children. 
They are males, they are boys. Along the main Kaswa Winneba Highway is a shop where the prime suspect usually sits with his friend who repairs motorbikes. A woman we spoke with says one of the people tagged as Eric Dier's accomplice is the owner of the shop. She says on the day the incident happened, Ibrahim Zakaria was called by his friend, the prime suspect, to help him because his car had been snatched. She believes Eric Dia used that as a ploy to escape and that Ibrahim Zakaria is innocent. He, he had a call, so he left here. So by then, the, the crime has already shoot. They have already killed the police then. Before Ibrahim had a call, they, they've stolen the car. So as they were chasing the car, the, 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 the suspect, the one they are claiming he killed those people, show them where the car is. So according to information, when they got there, the crime suspect collected Ibrahim's motto and asked them to drive the car back. That's why they caught Ibrahim in the car. But he wasn't part of them when they killed the police. They killed the police before... They were chasing the car that Anne Roberts had stolen the car, but it wasn't Anne Roberts that was, that was chasing the car. It was the guy himself who was driving the car. That is the news we had. Those people have seen him. Me, I didn't see him that very day, but people saw him himself driving the car before he called Ibrahim that the car has been stolen. He was in the car, according to the police, Ibrahim was in the car because the guy collected Ibrahim's motto. Mm. and ask them to bring their car back. Okay. That's why they caught Ibrahim in the car. Maxwell Agbaba with that report. Now, reports available to join you suggest six black migrants have been killed in the latest wave of attacks uh, in South Africa. Buildings and vehicles have been burned to ashes and shops looted in what many believe to be xenophobic attacks. The incident was reported uh, to have begun sometime this month but escalated on Sunday with massive attacks. A Ghanaian journalist Yakubu Yaro gave us this account of the current situation in South Africa. The current situation is a bit tense. Even though we do have a lot of securities, mostly police who are patrolling the environment, that is still volatile. You can't predict because the whole thing is out of control. The cops were supposed to take initial steps the very moment we got a threat. This is a situation where we find ourselves in which the securities never took the warnings. They never took it serious. We do have various aspects of securities, the intelligence, et cetera, military, all involved. But then none of them um, took it upon themselves to fight and maybe probably find an amicable solution in reaching a peaceful agreement with the organizers of this protest. So mm -hmm. as of now, Mm. You, you find securities, mostly police, across the country, but then the crime is still ongoing. If it's not xenophobic, then we expect the criminals who are looting to attack shops like KFC, which is Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald, Pep, Edgar's, like a lot of shops being owned by white people. Or if it's not xenophobic, why are they not attacking such shops? But they are mostly attacking shops being owned by black migrants like myself and yourself. Two, if you, uh, we already know, uh, we all know something. Something is the big hub of South Africa, which is located in the central part of jo uh, Johannesburg. It's mostly dominated by whites. This attack doesn't spread there. In the history of South Africa, they've never ever been attacked. No single white has, has ever been attacked whenever such things comes in. So how then are they defining xenophobia? If it's something being done by local blacks against blacks from even neighboring countries, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, uh, Mozambique, etc., who are even supplying them a lot of resources, mm. you understand? So the government is just trying every means to cover it, make it sound like it's a criminal element that is ongoing. Sure. And the worst part, the police has already um, arrested almost 120 people. All these people, believe you me, tomorrow you see them walking freely on the street. Since 2008, any time they arrest um, these perpetrators, they, there is no conviction. We've never heard that maybe they were prosecuted to court and then this was the final uh, sanction of verdict. Nothing of that sort happened. Yakubu Moro spoke to me earlier on News Desk. Meanwhile, Ghana's High Commissioner to South Africa, George E.C. Boating, is urging Ghanaians resident in South Africa to stay safe and out of trouble. We all know the happenings, the current happenings, very disturbing 
uh, very unfortunate attacks on uh, foreign nationals. It's by appeal to my fellow Guyanians to monitor situations carefully. Those who live around prone violence areas must take caution. And then those um, uh, also living around hotspots, what I would describe as places I would describe as hotspots, must also take caution and monitor uh, movements of uh, most probably assailants. When there is any need for us to put in place contingency measures, I will describe, I will take it as contingency measures, assure, uh, be assured that they will do it. I have uh, capable, able members of staff who in all situations are ready to work. So if there should be any need of any contingency measure, I will put in place. Away from South Africa, family of the late Na Andani Dasana Abdullahi has withdrawn from the Bimbala Chieftaincy landmark peace negotiation process. Spokesperson for the family, Osman Kika, declared their non-participation in mediation talks at a press conference Monday. This comes in the wake of the announcement by President Kufado on the 16th of August in Bimbala during his two-day tour of the northern region that the Awamafia of the Anglo state, Togbi Siri II, is set to mediate the Bimbala chieftaincy dispute. There was subsequent commission of the team in the Volta region last week to begin work to reach an amicable agreement that could bring an end to hostilities. But addressed in a press conference Monday in Bimbala, spokesperson of the family, Osman Kika, said the process is leading to the setting up of a mediation committee falls short of traditional protocol and he says it's characterized by a high level of conflict of interest. Say that no one should be allowed to benefit from his crime. In fact, we do not expect you to be the facilitator for people benefiting from their crime. Vana Atta Abarika was the lead suspect in connection with the murder of the late chief on the 19th of June 2014. But until these people are tried before any court of competent jurisdiction, the family is yet to believe in the real oath of the presidency and his trust in the judicial system and the enforcement of the rule of law and his determination to slash off nuisance and madness in the society. Having read the judgment, where is the ambiguity to merit the appointment of a sole mediator? Where is the dispute to be mediated upon? Again, how could all the eight chiefs of the two lower courts and the five justices of the Supreme Court of Ghana all get it wrong. And how mightier is the sole mediator that his findings and conclusion will work? Ladies and gentlemen, I think something is wrong somewhere. Mr. President, we think you are gambling on what happened in the bomb to try to set aside the award by Nairi, the ruling of the regional House of Chiefs, the National House of Chiefs, the High Court, and the Supreme Court. We must therefore help you highlight the differences here and point to you and point to why your steps in this case are misguided. This is very different from the case of Bimila. None of the parties petitioned ruled in favor of the Napana. All bodies saw the truth and ruled unanimously in favor of the Bumayuli family, Na and Dani Gassana, and for that matter, the vulnerable of the people of Nana.
You can identify his interest. He's not a member of Naya Bomayeli in the first place. Trust me, I am not a kingmaker, but ideally, a where fairness work, even if the chief of Bimbler's funeral is performed. If you are allowed as Vona to be the next chief, would you like to be there? Considering the fact that your name has come several as a role player in the middle of the chief. So, are you the only person who has a gun? Ask Vona, is he the only person who has a weapon? But he doesn't know that it's, if not because of the rule of law and then the fear of God, everybody can do that, not sit in and go scot free. Now, a meeting between the Mediating Committee and the Northern Regional Security Council is scheduled to take place later today. I will bring you updates of that outcome when it happens. Now, residents of Yeji in the Pu East District of the Punu East Region are appealing to government to provide them with armed police officers to fight the alarming rate of armed robbery within the area. Some traders told Joy News incessant attacks on them by the armed robbers is affecting their businesses. Anasa Bet has more in this report. Traders of the Yeji market in the Pru East district of the Bono East region say they are under severe risk of either losing their lives or their earnings each time they visit the Yeji market. According to these traders, highway robbers have been terrorizing them on the roads to and from their communities. The situation to them is worrying as it's in turn affecting business activities within the area. James Humado is the community secretary of Wutideke, a community along the Volta Lake. A community like Wutideke, armed robbers always attacking us every present day. In fact, especially market day, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. If you pass that way, you will never get yourself freely. Always, day and night. Even sometimes they, they attack uh, these uh, Okada people and they get the motto from them. Even if you carry a basket or you carry anything at all, they can catch, they can catch you and then beat you. Even without any money to, they will just wounded you and then go away. So we are, we are appealing for the, uh, the government to help us. In fact, other than that, uh, we can uh, survive. For Hasia Abigail, the situation is disturbing considering the fact that robbery cases do take place even when police officers are on duty. What the robbers have been doing the way this, it disturbs us a lot. Example, Sundays like this. It, it, it's difficult for us to pass on this way because we are afraid. Exactly by 6 o'clock, you can't pass on this road. Yeah, so it, dis, it disturbs us a lot. So they should do something about it for us. We have some police officers, they, they are not serious. If they come, they are come to take money. The, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that they know something about that. Because at times they'll be on the road and that will happen. Like traders who visit from nearby communities, market women within Yeji are also worried with the situation. Queen Mother of the Fish Buyers Association tells Joy News that the situation is gradually collapsing the Yeji market. We have no market, but this meat market here. Put it okay. Black and Ted Jatako. But when the people are coming to the market, they get attacked by armed So these traders say they are moving to the KJG market. If nothing is being done, the market will collapse at the end. She wants military patrol deployed on the Yeji route to provide protection for traders. We beg government to, as a matter of urgency, deploy the military to the area so they protect the people before something terrible happens. Most of the roads linking these communities to Yeji are in deplorable states. Some of these traders believe that is a contributing factor to the increasing cases of robbery within the area. The terrible nature of the road is a contributing factor. If the road is good, they can't do what they are doing. It is terrible, so the robbers hide in the bushes and then attack the traders who use motorbikes and tricycles. So we are appealing to government to please come to our aid.
In a recent visit of the area by the Bono East Regional Minister, Honorable Kofi Amwakohene, President of the Brun Ahafu Regional House of Chiefs and Paramount Chief of the Yeji Traditional Council, Piman Pim Nanayao Kabrese, called on the minister to beefing up security within the area. I'm robbery. Sir. I'm robbery. Armed robbery is very rampant over here in Yeji, both day and night. That's what we've been facing here. So we wanted to call on you to speak to the regional police commander to assist us with more men because we have fewer police personnel over here, so they can help the police commander here. On his part, Bono East Regional Minister indicated that security is paramount on his list of items to be addressed with agency. I'm robbery in the area, especially still within the eastern part of the same Bono East. It's so rampant. Sometimes in an area it happens four times in a day, which is too bad, and we need to curb it. Luckily, coming from a security background, I believe I cannot talk so much about it now in camera, but trust me, we are going to do a lot of work on it. We are going to have a RISEC meeting immediately to have a preliminary discussion. In the interim, we have started looking for logistics, which will soon be ready. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Yeji.